All right, you can just tell me when, Brita. Okay, awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Sanrud. I am the vice chair of the member education committee um, for MFU. I'm also the Mille Lacs County um, chapter president. And this is our farm financials webinar. Um, we're going to have Nathan, who is an extension educator with Ag Business Management, um, go over farm financial documents for you all. And then um, we'll have some sharing from Hannah Bernhardt of Medicine Creek Farm about how she manages her farm's financials. Um, and then we'll open it up for some questions and um, resource sharing. So we'll kick it off with Nathan. All right, thank you, Rachel, for introducing me. And I'm going to share my presentation and hopefully this works as it should. All right, can we see my presentation? Looks like we're good to go. All right, so I'm gonna walk through this PowerPoint. I have about 30 minutes to go through a few of these different uh, financial statements to help get everyone educated, introduced on what they are. So first off, we have this quote. People in business usually fall into one of two categories, those who are fascinated with numbers or those who are frightened by them. And we can see it's by this Ron Abrams. And the quote goes on to continue, numbers are neither magical, mysterious, nor menacing. They merely reflect other decisions you have made previously in the business. Every business decision leads to a number and taken together, these numbers form the basis of your financial forms. But the numbers themselves are not decisions. They merely come from decisions already made. So hopefully this is fitting for our talk today. Um, and we're gonna start off this with the balance sheet. And again, some of you are probably a little more comfortable with numbers. And some of you, maybe not as much as the quote just alluded to, but we'll start off with the balance sheet. So again, determining my farm's financial condition. So a balance sheet. So it's a snapshot in time. So we'll elaborate on that a little bit further, but it's highlighting what your assets are, what your liabilities are, and then also your net worth, which is also called owner's equity. So we might use those terms interchangeably. So again, at a specific point in time, so the balance sheets, they will be dated. So at that specific date, it'll be accurate, but maybe in two or three months down the road, the assets in your business are going to change. Maybe you have some corn in the, in the bin. Well, maybe, you know, come January 1st, you had, you know, 10,000 bushels in the bin, but come April 1st, you've sold most of that off. So your asset structure is gonna change. So again, at a specific point in time is important to remember. So again, assets, those are the things that are owned or payable to the business. So people like assets, right? They want more assets, whereas liabilities, those are obligations owed to others. So the biggest thing will be loans, right? You own loans to the bank, or maybe it's a different lending institution, but those loans are liabilities. Whereas the net worth, that's going to be your total assets minus your total liabilities. So what's left at the end of the day? You know, what is your farm worth once all of your debts are paid? And the balance sheet, we can measure our liquidity and our solvency. So liquidity, the ability of the business to generate cash when needed. You know, can we pay our bills as they come due? And solvency, the overall financial risk of the business. So comparing assets to the amount of debt. One ratio we can look at that um, was looking at how much of your farm does the bank own versus how much you actually own is one way we could look at solvency. So this is a very simple balance sheet. Some people call them kind of a T-chart because we can see assets, liabilities on one side uh, versus the other with the line down the middle dividing the two. So we'll just kind of break down briefly here what all goes into these different categories. So first off, we have our current assets. So those are gonna be a lifespan, 
lifespan of less than one year. So think of our cash accounts, your crop inventories, livestock held for sale, some of these prepaid expenses and supplies. And you might say, well, whole, you know, our cash accounts better be active for more than one year. And yes, you do want your cash accounts, your bank accounts to stay a positive number, but the number in that, you know, the thousand dollars in your bank account, whatever that number is, will change over in terms of crop sales and livestock sales. And again, your crop inventories, you shouldn't be having, you know, two, three, four years worth of crop inventories on hand, but selling last year's crop as we move into the next year. Move on down the list, we have our intermediate assets. So again, the lifespan one to 10 years. Some people say one to seven, one to eight years. These aren't necessarily hard set in stone numbers, but again, more than one year. These are typically gonna be your machinery and equipment and your breeding livestock. So again, your machinery and equipment, you're gonna keep those for more than one year. But again, over the course of your farming career, you will have to update and update your machinery line and buy newer equipment. Same with breeding livestock. They're good for several years, but uh, most animals don't live much past 10 years. Then we have our long-term assets, which their lifespan is gonna be greater than 10 years. So think of our land and buildings. Next, we'll switch over to the liability side of thing and the timelines match up with the assets. So our short-term, or excuse me, our current liabilities, again, less than the one year. So accounts payable, accrued expenses, your operating loan, and the principal due on term debt that year. So maybe you have various loans due, you know, five, 10 year, 20 year loans on your land. The principal that's due this current year is then a current liability. Again, intermediate liabilities. Loans with the original term from one to 10 years. So these loans will be taken out to purchase machinery, equipment, or breeding livestock. So again, matching up with the assets. And then long-term, loans with the original term of greater than 10 years. So again, typically, if you're going to be purchasing buildings or purchasing land, you will have the long-term loans, which again, long-term liabilities. So then we wanna throw in this extra column in here, this extra row, about personal, right? Always on the farm, you know, it always gets a little bit gray on what's personal and what's business, right? You live where you work, you work where you live, everything kind of blends together. Nothing wrong with that, but we do want to highlight some of these personal assets versus personal liabilities. So maybe the personal assets will be the house, the house that you live in. Maybe you have a personal car that's not related to the farm. And then on the personal liabilities, maybe you have some student loan debt, some credit card debt. Maybe you have a loan on the, the personal car that you have. Another personal asset might be retirement accounts. You know, maybe it's going to be some Roth IRAs, some 401ks, whatever the retirement accounts are that are not tied directly with the farm. We want to break down to our personal. And then we can get down to our net worth. So again, the difference between total assets and total liabilities. So again, how much is this farm? How much are you as a business owner worth at the end of the day when all debts are paid? Okay, and then the total assets will equal total liabilities plus net worth. So again, that's kind of a quick summary of what our balance sheet is going to look like. So we can see that again, the balance sheet, a snapshot in time, right? A specific point in time. So doing these every year, updating them every year, we can watch our, our business grow and expand and change as time moves on. We can measure our net worth change. And again, doing these every, doing these annually will minimize the within year cyclical changes as in when you buy seed, right? That's a, a big liability that you have to pay. 
and then you plant it and you really don't get an asset out of that until you harvest the crop come fall when you you know put the corn or soybeans in the bin so that's kind of doing this one day throughout the year and updating it annually can minimize those within your changes here's just a real quick sample this is just a case farm um, using this FinPack software that's a, a, a sample. So we can see at the top there's a date, you know, January 1 of 2019, breaking down our current assets, breaking down the current liabilities, intermediate assets and intermediate liabilities, and long-term assets and liabilities are right below that, just not on the screen. So this is kind of a breakdown. We can see there are uh, Current assets are corn and soybeans that are in the bin at a given price. You know, we have our machinery schedule broken down and then our machinery loans broken down next to that under the intermediate liabilities. So this is a, a little clear example of what this balance sheet will look like. So just a couple of the challenges that we see with the balance sheet is what number do you put down on this previous slide? We have our machinery schedule of $537,000. How do you come up with the value there, right? Using the market value, as in if you're gonna take this tractor, this piece of machinery and sell it at an auction today, what number would it sell for? You know, is it worth $10,000, $20,000? Putting a realistic number down is pretty important. So that's the market value approach. And then the, the cost or the book value approach, we're valuing assets at the purchase price minus depreciation. And that's again, uh, just two separate ways to do that. But part of the time with using depreciation, you know, we don't want to be using our tax depreciation necessarily because you can, you know, use some sped up depreciation with taxes, we want to use an economic depreciation when we use these for our balance sheet purposes. And another thing we want to highlight is land values. So we put on this slide here that land values never change, but we do want to highlight, you know, if we have land values that maybe our, our father bought or we bought 30 years ago, we may want to update that land value price from our purchase price of you know 20 30 years ago to a, a more accurate realistic price of what today's market's going to be but we do not want to change land values annually because they can really fluctuate and can really distort our net worth changes at the end of the day when we're comparing our balance sheet from one year to the next just because your land value would increase a thousand dollars an acre does that really mean your farm was that much more productive that year you know, not necessarily just because your land values have increased. So market value, it's a lot better in, in comparison to the book or cost value when, um, when looking at that for certain situations. We'll go into a little more detail in the next slide. But again, it's just simply estimating a fair market value, a sale price that could be expected at an arm's length transaction. So the advantages of that, um, again, best estimate of solvency. If we were to liquidate, liquidate the farm today, what are we expected to get in terms of, of a sale price and can we pay off our debts? But again, the big disadvantage is mixing our net worth change from earnings from market value changes. Maybe you bought a, a tractor at a pretty good deal a couple of years ago, and it's actually worth more now than when you bought it a few years ago. Using the cost value, you're gonna be depreciating that asset and the price will come down, whereas the market value, it won't decrease at such a rate. So again, we just wanna keep in mind that net worth changes in earnings versus market value. So again, debt capacity, collateral analysis, and then estate planning. So when we're looking at maybe transferring the farm from you know, father to daughter or one family member to another, market value is gonna be the most realistic approach of what the farm is worth. 
you know, using the cost value again isn't always the most accurate for what this farm is worth today. So with the state planning, the farm transfer process, market value is a better approach. Okay, again, just a real quick review here. A snapshot, assets, liabilities, and equity at a specific point in time. Again, they're gonna change as the year progresses. Assets are what the farms owns, liabilities is what the farm owns, owes to others, and then the owner's equity, the net worth, assets minus liabilities is the difference between the two. Again, measuring each year to help evaluate uh, farm business gains. Again, quick screenshot of what the balance sheet is going to look like. Next, we'll glance or we'll move into the income statement. So we'll look at both the income statement and a cash flow statement uh, for the next 10 minutes or so. If there's any questions, I think we'll save those towards the end. So the income statement, that's going to be determining your farm's profitability. So the balance sheet simply says what the farm owns and what it owes to others. It doesn't necessarily say if the farm made any money. You know, over the course of years, if they have considerable assets, they must have made some money. But in this given year of 2020 or 2021, a balance sheet doesn't say we made money this year. So the income statement is important also to look at measuring profitability. How much money did we make during the time period? And again, it's typically a calendar year, typically what we use for taxes. Okay, so again, the profit equation, our total farm revenue minus our farm expenses is our net farm profit, right? Sounds pretty simple. You know, there's a lot of things that go into either side of that equation, but that's where we're gonna be starting. So there's a few different ways to do an income statement. A cash-based accounting system for our income statement, that is what typically most farmers use for tax purposes, cash-based accounting. So if most of you have a Schedule F taxes that hopefully you turned in here a, a month, or, month or so ago, typically cash-based accounting. There's a little check, check box on the top if it's cash or accrual, typically farmers use cash. Nothing wrong with that, but we're just showing the other options here of accrual, which is a little bit more in depth. Um, and then we can talk about this a little bit, the accrual adjusted. We're gonna take the cash-based accounting and look at our inventory changes and depreciation. Okay, so the problem with our income statement with tax forms, again, cash-based, which isn't necessarily a problem, but we do have rules that can distort income. You know, the biggest one here is fast depreciation. So if you use Section 179, use some fast depreciation on an asset you purchased in calendar year 2020, you know, let's just say you purchased a tractor and you wrote off $25,000 worth of that tractor purchase in depreciation, does that really mean the farm made $25,000 less, right? It's an expense in terms of taxes, but it really doesn't mean that the farm didn't made $25,000 less. So we just want to say that the tax statement isn't the most accurate for what happened. The accrual method, um, again, it's a little bit more in depth, but it's going to recognize revenue when it's earned and recognize expenses when they're incurred. Um, so again, the income more accurately matched with expenses. Um, whereas the accrual adjusted method is going to take your net cash income and adjust for inventory changes. So we'll go through a few examples that hopefully uh, makes this make a little more sense. So again, the cash income can give the wrong profitability signal. Again, the two or three year leg. So the biggest, we'll go through a couple um, examples here, but if you're, you're farming and you don't sell all of your grain in year 2020, but your grain bins are full moving into 2021, again, does that mean you didn't make much money in 2020? 
just because you didn't sell it, you still have it in the bin. So that's why this cash income can give this two or three year leg in profitability. So we have this example that we'll walk through here. We have the Jones farm and the Smith farm. Gross income you can see is identical. Their cash expenses, net cash income, depreciation, schedule F income, $10,000. They're the same on both sides. Okay, nothing wrong with that. We'll just go through an example, the Jones farm. They had this inventory change. Their bins were full at the end of the year of $100,000 worth of extra corn and soybeans that they didn't have to sell or they didn't sell yet. So really their net income should move up that $100,000 in that inventory change. Whereas on the Smith farm, they had to sell excess inventories to make ends meet at the end of the year. So they sold $100,000 of extra grain they had on hand, really showing that their net farm income should be that much less. So two slides ago, these numbers were both the same, but with these inventory changes, we can really see a drastic difference from one farm to the next. And again, most farms probably aren't quite this dramatic, but we wanna highlight the importance of the inventory changes used on, you know, that farms have to really show income analysis and what their actual income statement should be. So again, the income statement, the accrual adjustments removes the distor distortions and better gauges true profitability. And that's what we want to highlight, the accrual adjustments, inventory changes and depreciation. Okay, so again, income, you take away your expenses, you get your net cash income. And again, typically with your Schedule F for taxes, that's where you stop. But we're seeing a more accurate depiction with the accrual adjustments of inventory and depreciation gets to a little more accurate net farm income number. So just keep that in mind next time you look at your uh, Schedule F income and when you're doing an income analysis. So the last thing we'll talk about here for the next few minutes is the cash flow statement. So again, just because you made money during the year with your income statement that we just saw, you know, where did the money go, right? And a cash flow statement is going to help determine where the farm's money is going. Okay, so the, again, it'll explain the sources and use of cash. So where money was earned, where money was spent, we're gonna be tying together the balance sheets and income statements for how it changes our cash accounts. So we just have two very quick balance sheets here, right? So we have one from 20, 2020, January 1, the next one's January 1 of 2021. We can see that the assets have jumped up, our net worth has changed. What really happened? Giving only the balance sheets we can't necessarily say what we bought or what happened that changed our assets and net worth numbers. So again, the cash flow statement will be a better explanation of what happened. So we have three main areas that we'll quickly summarize for our cash flow statement. Cash from operations, cash from investing, and cash from financing. So we have this real quick summary. You know, we start with $8,000. We earn $45,000 from the operation, we lose $30,000 from investing, and we lose $11,000 with financing. So what does that mean? So again, the cash from operations. So that's gonna be your typical farming operations where you sold $500,000 worth of grain in the year and your total cash expenses of seed, fertilizer, chemicals, land rent, all those different expenses that you have of $455,000, making $45,000 from the sale of corn and soybeans, livestock, whatever the case is on your farm. And as we move on down the list, cash from investing activities. So we can see in this example, we have a capital sale. So we must have sold like a, a small piece of equipment or something for $5,000. And then we purchased a piece of equipment 
for $35,000. So the investing activities here are buying and selling equipment and different things to run your farm. So in this example, we lost $30,000, but maybe lost isn't the best term. We spent $30,000 upgrading our machinery line. But again, in our cash flow, that's how it's breaking down. And then our last section here is cash from financing. So this is gonna be, again, money borrowed. So we have a cash inflow when we borrowed money from the bank. The bank gave us more money. So we borrowed $30,000. We can see the principal paid, you know, that we gave back to the bank. We spent $16,000. And then our family living expenses, where we spent another $50,000 to, um, you know, keep the family going and, and the different things associated with that. And we have some non-farm income in this example that we brought into our cash flow statement. So the cash from financing, so again, our borrowed money, our money paid back to the bank, our living expenses, we spent some $11,000 in that. So through these three different categories in this quick example, we can see that we spent, or we made, we made about $4,000. Our beginning and ending cash balance is an increase of $4,000. So we made enough money from our operation activities, the raising and selling our crops or livestock, upgrading our machinery line and the family living expense, plus this non-farm income, the farm made money here at the end of the day. So again, the key points here, attracts cash through the business a cash flow statement is typically looking forward a year. So you're going to be doing the cash flow statement for 2021. What do you expect to sell bushels wise, price wise, or quantity of livestock? What do you expect to sell over the course of the next year? So again, it does not track the business performance, um, but we can see where the money is coming in and going. Over time, Cash from the operations should, pull, should pay for the cash used in investing and in financing activities. Again, so use for planning purposes, will our business cash flow for the year? So again, you will do this typically monthly or quarterly. So have each month broken down or each quarter broken down on how much money you expect to come in and what payments and what other expenses you have to pay as the year progresses. So again, complete the monthly cash flow projection. This is in terms of your line of credit. You want to monitor your budget that you set up at the beginning of the year to see how well it reflects what actually happens during the year. Don't finance your capital purchases on a line of credit. And we do highlight, we recommend trying to zero out your line of credit once a year and do you know, recognize that you're paying interest on that line of credit and it's not just free money floating out there for you to use. So just some highlights to think about as we wrap up this talk. Again, tracking money through the business. We want ending cash to be bigger, to be greater than beginning cash. We want our operation to make money throughout the year. Again, our three main areas for the cash flow statement. And another wrap up, you know, are your records in order, right? Do you have these three financial statements for your farm? You know, do you need, do you know some of your key ratios for your farm? Have you ever benchmarked your operation? What are some of the strengths and weaknesses or risks of your own farm. So again, just a few things to, to think about as I wrap up my talk here, spent about a half hour on some of these financial statements. So um, I can take questions or if you have another speaker, I can wait until the end. Thanks, Nathan. Um, that, was, that was great and I feel like I know I have questions, so I think maybe we open it up for maybe five or 10 minutes of questions now, and then we'll have Hannah go. 
if that's okay with you, Nathan. That sounds great. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. And I'm ready for questions. Well, I can kick off questions. Um, one question that I had is, um, so we've got three different um, financial documents here. What are you looking at um, when you're trying to assess how a farm is doing financially as a whole um, and whether or not it's improving or you know could use improvement over time? What are you looking at year after year to understand where a farm business is sitting? Yeah, good question. So just, you know, what's important? Um, well, I'll start off right away. A lot of times, if a, a farmer is going to a bank to borrow some money, typically a bank will make these statements. Like they will talk with the farmer, walk through their balance sheet, you know, what do they own? You know, what, uh, what liabilities do they have outstanding? They'll walk through an income statement roughly. Typically, it'll just be your Schedule F you know, for tax purposes, for how much the farm makes money. So if the farmer doesn't make these own statements, a bank will make them for them. But if I was going to analyze a farm, I think a big thing is the income statement. And again, the accrual adjustments in that income statement, because with Schedule F, you can distort your income a little bit. That isn't always the most accurate representation of what happened. Whereas the accrual adjustments will just make a little bit more clear of how much money that farm made. So I think the income statement is an important thing to look at. You know, just because the farm owns a lot of stuff, you know, with the balance sheet, that doesn't always say that they're profitable. And to stay in business for very long, you do need to have some profits. So making these accrual adjustments on the income statement are very important, just at least to, to think about if you're not formerly going through the process, but understanding that Schedule F maybe isn't the most accurate. And then looking forward with that cash flow and saying, I expect to make this much money next year based on maybe you're doing some forward contracting. You know, corn and soybeans are pretty decent prices right now. Are we locking those prices in? You know, just because your balance sheet says that you have you know, 10,000 bushels of corn in the bin and you value that at $5, is it really worth $5? Are you, if you have a contract in place, then yes. But if you don't, if you're just hoping that the markets will stay that high, that doesn't really mean they're worth $5 a bushel. Until it's sold, then it's worth $5 a bushel. So the balance sheet, again, you can distort a few things, just be increasing the values of different things. So the cash flow is also important just to prove that you have income coming in for the next year. If that helped answer your question, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting to, I, I have a little bit less of a conventional farm, but it's um, always interesting to look at how I view how my business is doing and how my income statement looks and how my schedule F, like those all look like a different picture, even though they're the, you know, they're still all my farm at the end of the day. Um, so that is really helpful. And that's a good point that they don't always look that similar. So taking them all into account is important. This is Todd Churchill. I think uh, it might be worth talking about depreciation because farming is typically a pretty capital intensive, capital equipment intensive business. And so one of the things we have to keep track of, uh, you're doing a great job. It's a great presentation. I'm going to use this with my clients for sure once it gets recorded and, and published. I, um, I do a lot of accounting work for CLA, which is a CPA firm in southern Minnesota in the Rochester office. But I find that it's, it's really hard for my clients to get their head around all this fixed assets and we depreciate it for tax purposes, but it's not, that's not what it's worth. And the balance sheet looks like they don't have, they have no net worth. You know, so I thought you might want to be curious your perspective and how do you explain that in simple terms? 
Thanks, Nate. Yeah, so I guess you, your main question is how does your depreciated assets, let's just say a, a, maybe a barn, right? You can depreciate that over time with tax purposes. And then through your tax balance sheet, that uh, asset is, is worth nothing at the end of the day. Whereas in terms of reality, there is some market value still there. You know, same with equipment. You can you can purchase a piece of equipment and accelerate your depreciation fairly quickly. Whereas showing that you ha you have that much value in that piece of equipment, and at the end of the day, it still might have some market value. Um, hopefully, does that kind of get to your point, Todd? Yeah, that's helpful. I was thinking more along equipment. So one of one of my observations is that larger um, grain crop farm um, operations, the fundamental driver of profitability is equipment utilization. How good a job are you able to do at buying the equipment that you need, and then how many how many bushels of production can you use that equipment to produce? Because by and large, yield is determined. I mean, yield's pretty similar. Um, we're all planting more or less the same seeds using the same fertility, but um, the expense that we put into our equipment or, or the purchase cost we put into our equipment divided by the total number of bushels of output on that equipment before we have to trade it in for newer equipment is a big driver of positive cash flow. So how do you recommend that farmers keep track of their equipment costs tax depreciation, so your tax return and your tax, if, if you only track your fixed assets and your books for tax purposes, that's not gonna be very helpful because your equipment's worth a lot more than what your tax depreciation says it is. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And I guess your point is, what do farmers do with that knowledge that their actual market value versus their tax basis can be quite a bit different? Yeah. yeah. I guess part of it is kind of determining the, it, it's maybe easier said than done, but determining the best time to trade in their equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe if their tax basis is zero, it doesn't mean that they should trade it in and upgrade. Maybe there's still some life potential in that and they should still hold on to it and, and keep using it for a few more years instead of buying something newer and, and better. Right. And, and different you, farmers yeah. have different logical, you know, different mindsets on how often they need to upgrade equipment. You know, not always the farmers with the most new or brightest colored tractors are, are the most profitable. And holding on to some of these assets for a few more years, getting a few more years of use out of them can be more profitable by not having that, that new payment. I totally agree. But uh, sometimes new paint is worth more than the dollars associated with that in terms of status quo or whatever, keeping up with the neighbors. But I do think farmers need to pay attention to, and again, uh, profitability and taxes they're paying in because if they can buy a new piece of equipment, write it off, their tax taxes go down. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most profitable thing to do over the course of more than that one year. Right. And I think, um, I, I think it's important to understand and to try to keep track of what do you own and uh, what, what is it worth as, if you trade it in today and how many, how, how many dollars of, of product, of crop, or, or if it's livestock equipment, it's you know, for, for livestock, but Tractors are easy because you can sell a tractor and not sell your business. You can't very well sell your, if you have a feedlot, if you have a, a silo or a grain unloader, that's a permanent part of your, your deal and you can't really trade it in. It's just, it's just there. But equipment utilization is a really important thing that, that I find most farmers don't really think about very much. How many bushels of crop am I able to get through this particular piece of equipment? Um, and, and your, your assessment is absolutely right. Those that 
uh, are able to use older equipment for longer periods of time typically have higher free cash flow than those that are uh, using new equipment continually. Yeah, I think, again, it's kind of a personal mindset of what they're comfortable with. And sometimes farmers are more apt to do repairs themselves versus trading it in and getting something new, right? That's part of it too. Whereas it's, you know, what is this farm comfortable doing? You know, maintenance or paying for new equipment. Um, But again, I think the profitability behind those isn't always the most thought after thing, right? Oh man, it's a good deal on this new tractor. They have some financing specials, whatever the case is, and they think they need to do it without always looking at long-term profitability. And I think that's one thing that we need to help educate farmers on, but it's still their decision at the end of the day, whether or not to oh, yeah. trade it in or, or keep it. Ethan, I would like to ask you a question as well. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I am, I'm wondering if you have any advice uh, for people on how to find a friendly lender. Um, you know, people tell stories about uh, how they've worked with somebody for a very long time and then all of a sudden the door gets slammed on them. And people who are on the verge of or currently in mediation, you know, they they may not have run out of assets, but they may be run out of cash and they run, they're running out of time. They just need more time. What are your thoughts about that and how is it just word of mouth or do is there a way to interview a lender to find out who actually is supportive of the family farmer yeah that's a good question i think it really depends on where you are and i don't think it hurts at all to shop around at different banks you know go to several within you know a 20 mile radius or whatever you're comfortable driving 50 mile radius Go, go asking some of these banks or going to the bank's websites and seeing if they focus on agriculture. You know, maybe their, their home screen is of a barn and silo with a tractor. So, well, maybe they're a little more agricultural friendly than the bank next door that, you know, their home screen is of, of car loans or more commercial real estate loans or something. So I think maybe just doing uh, an online search And again, I think word of mouth is important. One thing too is, you know, there's some agricultural newspapers, agricultural magazines out there, and what banks advertise in those? The banks that advertise in those are probably more agricultural friendly and more willing to work with you than banks that don't. Any other questions? I know we've got one more question, I think, from Mary. Mary, did you have a question? I'm just wondering that the, this is going to be the 2021 year is going to be so different, or in 2020, is going to be so different in that there was so many uh, stimulus payments to farmers. And uh, that's really not going to give a consistent look to what is actually going on on that farm. And when you go into some lenders, I'm going to use a farm serv- farm um, FSA, uh, they want five-year averages. They'll five-year average. Now these stimuli- stimulus payments are going to add money and that's not going to be available every year by any means, we hope. We hope this was just a, a Band-Aid, but uh, how are people going to look at the, especially the income tax, and they're going to look at the Schedule F, and they're going to say, well, look at what you did in 2020 compared to the other years. And for some of our producers, they received thousands and thousands of dollars. What? do you think is going to happen with that? No, I mean, you're exactly right. You know, in 2020, I think the USDA came out and said their 2020 analysis are roughly 
40% of all farm income was direct payments from the government. You know, 40% is a pretty big number. That's just under half of their income came from these somewhat unprecedented payments that they were given to the farm. And as you alluded to, 2021, probably not going to see that big of a number. And into 2022, um, I'm sure we will not see that big of a number. You know, as we move with there, most of these were COVID payments. Hopefully we're towards the end of our COVID pandemic. You know, our vaccine rollout's bigger and better every year, every day. Uh, expecting that COVID pandemic should end sometime. And the lack of these uh, payments, we can just call them, into 2021 and 2022 will probably drive down income. As you just mentioned, Mary, how are banks going to look at that? Because if pretty much any every farmer made money in 2020 just with the stimulus packages that were out there, and towards the end of the year, a lot of market prices came up pretty decently. We have, you know, top five year, you know, corn and soybeans are the highest prices they've been in about five to eight years without these government payments. So how are they gonna, banks gonna look at that and say, man, you did really well in 2020. And are they gonna say, if you don't do this well again in 2021, you know, we're gonna question borrowing to you again? Again, I, I can't, it, it's hard to say. You know, some will be a little bit more ready maybe to be, cautious with borrowing money if, if this rev government payments decline. But I mean, I don't exactly know how to answer your question, but you're exactly right that a lot of money was given out and I don't think we can anticipate that in the future. So making sure that farmers are making money through market channels and, and more typical farm revenue um, is important. And we don't want farmers to expect these payments and able to be profitable because I guarantee in the long run, they won't see these every year. So we just, we need to highlight that, you know, don't expect these on a regular basis and to do diligent, you know, when marketing your crop or livestock to get sale revenue that way. But we may have to do some educating with the lenders so that they understand what happened and why people were able to pay them current. Uh, we're finding with the mediation program, the numbers are way down because people were able to bring things current. That's not going to happen every year. And so I think the lenders need to know that also. And they're, they're going to have to make some exceptions when they're going on five-year averages. No, that's a solid point. I think you have a valid point that we need to do some education to the lenders and explaining why 2020 income was so high. And that again, that's, you know, roughly, let's just say 40%, we typically won't see into the future. So highlighting that importance of the government payments in terms of their on-time loan payments and how that will play out in the future. So I will take that to heart about educating more aid lenders about this issue in terms of what to expect in the next year or two or five. I'm gonna hop in here and make sure that we um, have time for Hannah. Um, our second presenter. Um, so Hannah is going to share a little bit about her experience um, with her farm financials and um, I'll let her share more. And then we, of course, will have more time for, for questions. Here. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Bernhardt. Um, I operate Medicine Creek Farm in northeastern Minnesota where I raise grass-fed beef and lamb and pastured pork, and I direct market it all to customers, um, you know, mostly urban in the Twin Cities and Duluth. Um, and most of that is through our website, sales through our website. Um, so 
when I started my first farming operation, it was in two, uh, 20, 2015. And, um, you know, I started with a lot of production experience, but not a whole lot of the business um, experience. And so in the beginning, I was just kind of hobbling it all together with Excel spreadsheets, which, you know, worked for that first year when I didn't need a loan yet. Um, but by 2016, I was buying land um, and buying a lot of livestock and needing an FSA loan. And um, I was able to get that first FSA loan without any help kind of, um, but, uh, you know, I quickly realized like I wanted more education about this. And so the, what I did was um, I enrolled in the Land Stewardship Project's Farm Beginnings course. And their first Farm Beginnings course um, covers a lot of things and it doesn't go super in depth in farm financials, but it's definitely a main component. And then through that process, um, there have a second course called the journey person course and this goes much more in depth into farm financials and part of that program um, includes enrolling you in farm business management and when i first learned about farm business management i was not that excited about it to be honest um, and I also had this idea that it was, you know, more for conventional farmers and I was kind of doing something different with direct marketing and I wasn't sure how helpful it would be. You know, that was one thing I had also encountered with Farm Service Agency was um, them not entirely understanding what I was doing, um, especially when they're figuring out, estimating like my future profits based on commodity prices when that is not what I'm charging. I'm charging much higher prices than that for direct marketing. Um, but so, you know, I, I saw a value in journey person. And so I, I did started farm business management um, and it was amazing. <laughs> and I've continued it um, uh, to this day, even though journey person course is only a two-year course. Um, and so through farm business management, it's basically uh, through community colleges, I think it's the Minsk system. So there are different um, instructors around the state and they cover different parts of the state. And so they work through different community colleges. Um, but it's really, it's not an on-campus program. I've never been to Riverland Community College, but my farm business management instructor either meets with me online or comes to the farm. And so it's completely individualized and based on what you need and what you want. Um, it's, I would say more than it being a college course, it's more like having a specific farm financial advisor who walks you through your financials. And so, um, you know, one of the main things we did right away was like, he set me up with QuickBooks online for my accounting. Um, and so, you know, I never had to take a class on that. He basically taught me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and what that lets me do is categorize my income and expenses um, and like helps us budget personally. We can see how much money we're spending even in our personal finances and the farm as well. And then it also helps me to break down my enterprises so I can see which, um, you know, like, do I have more expenses for pork this year or beef this year? And then I can make decisions like where do I need to raise prices or should I spend less money on something? Um, and also just evaluate them. Uh, like, for example, you know, with our sheep enterprise, we realized that our livestock guardian dogs were um, a big expense, even though we knew they were also saving us money by not losing any lambs. Um, but that also helped us make the decision to then go into breeding our puppies because now that's an additional um, revenue source for that enterprise. And also, you know, like having that instructor is a huge help now for applying for loans. Like as our business has gotten bigger and more complicated, it's a huge help to have someone, um, you know, helping me put together my balance sheet and my cash flows. And uh, my instructor will do that in FinPAC for me and print it out if I ever need anything, you know, he's there to respond right away and we'll send it. Um, 
it's also made me so that I'm completely ready for tax season. Like I have everything already done, which is just like a huge stress relief. Um, and it's also kind of like having someone to give me deadlines of when I need to get things done and making me accountable to stay on top of the record keeping part of it. So if I know I have an upcoming meeting, you know, I need to go through and categorize all my expenses and get my books balanced. Um, and then it's also huge for like long-term planning. And I think that's maybe the biggest thing. Like I could have sort of fumbled through some of the record keeping myself, but when we're trying to like grow the operation and picture what it's going to look like in two or three years and make that like try to project that it's that's really difficult for me to do and so what he does is helps us like evaluate if we spent this much money on our livestock this year you know where would that put our income in two years and what will that mean for paying down our debt that year and like what's our cash flow going to look like in two years and that helps us evaluate if we can take on more debt, um, if we can buy more livestock, that sort of thing. And the last thing I'll just say about that is that for beginning farmers, the beginning farmer tax credit includes an education credit provision. And so even after um, my journey person course was over, I've been able to get that education credit to pay for it because I would say that's also a big obstacle is that it does seem pretty expensive at least it did to me as a beginning farmer um and but now that tax credit covers the cost and I believe that when that tax credit ends for me um I'm also probably going to be able to access the Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program is now also helping people pay for farm business management so that's another avenue to um access tuition help. Um, but overall, I would just say like, it's, it's a huge stress management thing to have an advisor holding your hand and making you feel like you know what you're doing, answering questions when you have them. Um, and I, I would say that part of it is worth every penny. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, even though we knew a lot about farming, we had a farm business management instructor with our farm. And they bring out a whole different avenue of ideas. And also that you can compare yourselves to others with your same commodities. But they also bring in some different ideas because they aren't married to the farm like you are. Mm -hmm. So they come with a, a whole different body of knowledge. Yeah, I think that is part of it too. Like there's never, you know, my farm business management instructor is never panicking over our financials, you know? <laughs> he, he looks at the people's financials all the time. Nothing is ever a moment of panic for him. It's all just, well, this is what it looks like. And so this is how we make the next decision. And I think that's helpful. Um, one other thing I was going to add too, because uh, because that came up, is he is also a resource for finding lenders. You know, he knows some good lenders to work with and has recommended them to us when we, um, you know, when we're we can't use FSA anymore. Uh, he's already, you know, helping us build a relationship with a new lender. So that's another way that it's great. And that is extremely important because. Like Linda said, it's hard to find an agricultural lender who understands agriculture. And uh, we are getting fewer and fewer in Minnesota. We are finding a lot of people that are going out state. And it seems like sometimes when you get these huge corporations that you're borrowing from, the, the personal touch is gone. And so yeah. if you go and default with them, you're a number. Oh, um, I see one more question in the chat. So I just want to get to that. Um, the question is, do I use QuickBooks and FinPack together? And do I feel like it's important to use both? And can you use one without the other? Um, so yeah, like I use QuickBooks and I manage that myself. And then basically um, my farm business management instructor uses FinPack and he basically asks me the questions for him to fill out the FinPack. Um, and, you know, he'll send me those documents too. Uh, and 
the FinPAC side of things is really more what like FSA wants. And so I think the helpful thing about having a, a farm business management instructor do it is he knows what they want and the language they speak and how to put it in terms like, you know, they ask for, um, you know, I know how many bales of hay I have, but I don't know like the tonnage. And so he'll figure that out for me. Like, I don't even have to do that math myself. Um, and so I do think it's important to do both, but I would say you don't have to necessarily learn the FinPAC yourself if you have a farm business management instructor. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, we can keep ask, asking questions um, if we'd like, um, but I'd like to just take a second and um, thank Hannah and thank Nathan um, for presenting for us. Um, and if you two are able to stay on for questions, that's great. If not, um, totally understand um, and we can keep, keep the discussion going. Does anyone have any other final thoughts or questions? Um, can drop them in the chat as well and I can read them out if that's easier for folks. And if people think of questions after two, they can always email. Um, my email is hannah.bernhardt at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat. <laughs> Diana asked, is it common to swap farm equipment, um, tractors and like frequently? Um, we've had the same tractor for 30 years. I can try to answer that one. All right, so common, I mean, it's kind of a tough one to answer. It really is a, a farm preference, a personal preference. Some people really do feel like they need to update machinery uh, very frequently and always kind of have the latest and greatest, but as kind of Todd alluded to earlier, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most profitable. I mean, maybe it is. I'm not knocking anyone who does that, but if you have had the same tractor for 30 years, there's nothing wrong with that. I want to highlight that. That doesn't mean you're screwing up. You know, if you like the tractor and you don't want to upgrade, there's no problem keeping the same thing. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's a few tractors that my dad has used for 30, 40 years, and they still have them, and they don't have a problem with it. So, it does, again, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Um, does, that, does that help answer it? Okay. And I'll put my email in the chat as well. If anyone has any future questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'm here to help, so. Awesome, well, that seems like what we've got. Um, thanks again to Hannah and Nathan um, for your time and for everyone for the great discussion and for making time um, on this Thursday. Thanks everybody. From a staff person, do will, we, will this be, um, the recording be published or how will that be um, distributed? Yep, after after we're done here, it'll be, uh, sorry about that, I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> uh, it'll be recorded and it'll be put up on our YouTube page at a, at a further date. Brita's in charge of that. She'll, she usually gets a turnaround pretty quick. Awesome, thanks Glenn. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, let me know if you need.
me to discuss anything else with your group that it went well. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, have a good day, everyone.